Welcome to the breakdown where we break down all the messed up shit. The Snowtown Murders is probably one of the disturbing movies of all time. Directed by Justin Kurzel, The Snowtown Murders, or simply Snowtown, is based on the Snowtown Murders. This was a series of murders orchestrated by John Bunting with help from Robert Wagner, Mark Hayden, and Jamie Velasquez. Over 12 people were tortured and killed, with the majority of them being placed in barrels inside an abandoned bank vault in Snowtown. Two were buried in John Bunting's backyard. Many of these victims were murdered due to rumors that they might be pedophiles, but almost all of these claims were incorrect or unjustified. John Bunting himself was quite charismatic and charmed his partners into believing they were partaking in a moral crusade. However, it was anything but. And their actions placed a stigma on Snowtown, despite most of the murders not taking place in Snowtown. Be sure to click the link in the description to catch a proper video explaining the Snowtown murders and just how terrible they were. But today, I'll be talking about the movie. We return to Adelaide, Australia after Bad Boy Bubby, and I'll be summarizing what happens in this movie to let you know what to expect. You can find this film on Tubi. Do you want to see what happens, including all the messed up parts? Stay tuned for the breakdown. The movie begins with a pulsing tone, intense sounds along with someone recounting bad dreams. The person talks about a recurring dream where a faceless figure with a chihuahua in his neck is yapping at him. That's Jamie Velasquez. He's the one having all the weird dreams and lives with his brothers and his mom, Elizabeth Harvey. Elizabeth is dating someone and one day lets her boyfriend watch over her sons while she's out. Elizabeth's boyfriend is named Jeffrey and seems to have a good relationship with the sons. So very quickly, this movie got totally gnarly. Jeffrey makes each of the sons strip and takes obscene photographs of them. It's quite alarming to go from eating lunch to this. The boys tell their mom, but based on her reaction, this seems to be something that she's known about. It's really after thinking about it and looking at them that she walks outside and beats Jeffrey down on his own porch asking what have you done to my boys. She beat the shit out of him actually. She's screaming so loud they can hear her in Snowtown. After mixing his shit, she calls the police so that they can get here as soon as possible. Sometime later, presumably after she makes a statement to the police, the family goes to church. At church, they see their father, who wishes to be back in Elizabeth's life. For some reason, Jeffrey is not in a holding cell. He should be detained or investigated at least, but this dude is living life like normal despite what he's done. One night, Jamie wakes up hearing someone revving a motorbike outside. Whoever it is, they are purposely trying to get on Jeffrey's nerves by revving the bike repeatedly on his property. They are trying to help the family. We are introduced to them the next morning. His name is John Bunting. He seems really nice and cooked breakfast for everybody. John figures the police are ignoring the crime because this is a poor neighborhood. But John is a very likable guy. Oh, and this person here is Vanessa Lane, a transgender woman who also happens to be a convicted pedophile. John is like the cool uncle you wish was your father and already becomes a father figure for not just Jamie but the other Harvey kids too, giving bike rides to them all around the block and getting ice cream for them. Though not to eat, he gives them ice cream to vandalize Jeffrey's house. John hates pedophiles, but he also hates gay people and often mixes them together. John speaks with parents all over the neighborhood about how their children can be manipulated and abused and the police do nothing about it. Jamie is allowed to sit in with everybody to listen to their conversation. John asks what should be done about the convicted child molesters and Jamie says they should kill them. Vanessa is verbally jumped by everybody here. I'm almost surprised they aren't lynching her. She's clearly bothered by being around anybody here. Oh, and this guy is John's friend, Robert Wagner. The next day, John is just casually cutting kangaroos apart. Quiet foreshadowing to see these two partner up in kangaroo slaughter. They throw the remains all over Jeffrey the molester's property. Finally, John's antics force Jeffrey to move out of the neighborhood. So we can see John is acclimating with the Harvey Velasquez family and starts a relationship with Elizabeth, which Jamie is happy to see. Oh yeah, you see this guy? This is Troy. This is Jamie's older brother. Troy bullies him mercilessly, but he also rapes Jamie. Jamie has difficulty fighting back against him one day and is raped right in the doorway. 
you are forced to watch something which reminds you of the framing and irreversible. Another day, Vanessa gives information to John about people she suspects to be child molesters. John only associates with Vanessa by virtue of her knowing about pedophiles to hunt down. John and Jamie later get haircuts and John shows Jamie his wall. It's kind of like a wall an eccentric detective has who wants to solve a big case. Well this wall is a vigilante pedophile hunter wall with notes all saying I'm coming for you. And Vanessa is on the wall too. While having dinner, John asks Jamie if he likes being assaulted. He knows what the brother Troy does and tells Jamie he needs to stand up for himself and shows him a gun. You wanna shoot it? Shoot the dog. Huh? Shoot the dog. Shoot the dog, John says. He tells him to shoot the dog. Get up and shoot the dog. Jamie eventually shoots the dog, and she doesn't die immediately, so John shoots the dog again to finish it. Sometime later, Vanessa leaves a voicemail saying she's going to Queensland. In real life, Vanessa was forced to call her mother and insult her before telling her she would be moving to Queensland. She was tortured to death by John and his partner, Robert. Sometime later, we see the aftermath of a murder and dismembering, and Elizabeth seems to have had a part in it. They get into an argument where John kicks Jamie off the property. When Jamie asks his mom what happened, he next tells her, don't fuck this up, mom. John was the best thing that happened to Jamie in his eyes and doesn't want him to go away. Later that night, Jamie gets a breather outside where John sneaks up on him like Michael Myers, asking for his help in carrying kangaroo remains. Another night, he has an injured hand and John and Robert look to themselves and believe it's time to show Jamie the truth. They bring Jamie outside to their shed and John turns on the light and crouches down to uncover a body. This is the body of Jamie's best friend, Gavin. John stares at him, waiting on his reaction for like 10 seconds. And of course, he is sad and shocked. But then John shows Vanessa Lane's body in the barrel and Jamie runs out and vomits. Jamie fights John for killing his best friend, Gavin, but he was killed just because he did drugs. That's the only reason John says he killed him. Eventually, Jamie does calm down and John has him help him get rid of evidence. Time passes and things go back to normal until it's time for their next killing, Troy, Jamie's stepbrother. Jamie actively helps this time. They jump Troy while he's asleep and carry him to the bathtub to lock him in and torture him by crushing his toes. This is too much for Jamie and he leaves, but John forces him to come back in. They make him watch as they force Troy to record a message for his mother. Troy at this point just wants to die and it's the most disturbing part of the movie so far as they strangle him, stop for a few seconds and do it all over again, like 10 times. Jamie takes over strangling him just so that John can stop toying with his life. And so Troy is finally dead. Afterwards, the entire murder crew go out to eat. More people are killed by the group and Jamie is completely numb to it all. Jamie also helps John by impersonating one of their victims and taking their social security payments. They tried this with many of their victims. Their next victim named Gary O'Dwyer is being stalked by the crew. Jamie and the rest pretend to be friendly with Gary so they can kill him and appropriate his disability payments. They set their sights on their next victim, the wife of Mark Hayden. This is Mark Hayden who helps with the murders. Mark hates his wife for emasculating him all the time, but he also accidentally told her that he kills people. John is very forgiving after hearing this, surprisingly. What does set him off is Jamie using drugs. He beats him in the car to persuade him to stop. <laughs> this dude's life is over so hard. It's kind of sad, really. Everything is tearing apart, and Elizabeth has her youngest son, Alex, sent to live with his dad. Late one night, John plays a recording of their latest victim, Elizabeth Hayden. That was Mark's wife. Can you watch the kids with me, please? I tried to call me, Mama. I'm sorry. Elizabeth Hayden was their second to last victim, and so we got 20 minutes left in the movie. The murder group all ride out to Snowtown. It's called the Snowtown Murders, but most of the victims were killed in and around Adelaide. This is the abandoned bank vault where they placed many of their victims in barrels. John and Robert are planning on killing someone at the bank. Their next victim is Jamie's half-brother, David Johnson. 
Somehow, Jamie lures David out to Snowtown. His final drive is bleak and depressing. Finally, they make it to the bank at nighttime. David walks in, saying hello to John and Robert waiting on him. He slowly looks at all of them, realizing that all three of them plan on killing him. The movie ends as Jamie turns around to close the door, and the screen cuts to black. A final caption mentions on May 20th, 1999, police located human remains inside barrels at a disused bank in Snowtown, South Australia. Two more bodies were later found buried in the backyard of 203 Waterloo Corner Road, which is John's house. It was on May 21st where arrests were made. Robert Wagner pleaded guilty to three murders and was eventually convicted of 10. Mark Hayden was convicted of assisting in relation to seven of the murders. Australia's worst serial killer, John Bunting, was found guilty of 11 murders and sentenced to life imprisonment. Elizabeth Harvey died of cancer on September 6th, 2001. However, she was not innocent. Since she died, she was never sentenced for her part in the murder of Ray Davies. He was the second victim. Jamie Velasquez pleaded guilty to four murders and received a life sentence with a non-parole period of 26 years. He testified against John Bunting and is serving his prison term under a false name and an undisclosed location. Jamie could be released two years from now and he'd be 45 years old. Let's talk about the most disturbing moments in Snowtown. This movie was probably one of the best I watched for the channel, and it was a good kind of disturbing. Movies can be disturbing without sacrificing quality, and I believe they did really well with displaying the actions of the killers. What death they did show felt appropriate and not shock value. And you learn about the case. David Henschel did a great job as John Bunting. I it's just excellent. Lucas Pitaway did great as Jamie as well, even though it was his first big acting experience. Even still, this movie barely scratched the surface of just how evil these men were and what they did. I don't know how accurate the setting was for the movie compared to real life, but I was getting heavy gummo vibes whenever John talked to the neighbors. If you're from South Australia, please feel free to share how you view this movie. There are some scenes I didn't mention. I think most importantly, there was a scene where John was watching one of the Velasquez kids, like he's punishing him by having him hold bricks for a long time. And it looks like he's wearing some women's clothes, though maybe I'm stupid. I'm a little confused of what this scene is. Could it be more twisted than I realize? Or is it just him punishing him because he isn't following directions in his house? Just let me know what you think, please. Cinematography was great. The, the soundtrack was very fitting. And I say this is something you should race to watch. Most disturbing moment was Troy's torture. When John was toying with him, you see a level of terrifying that I haven't seen much from serial killers we talk about. And now he's rotting in prison. Only one of their victims was a convicted pedophile. And even that was unjustified, heartless, and sadistic. And that's it. Remember to be respectful in the comments. No hate of any kind is tolerated here. If you like this video, hit the like button and subscribe to see more messed up stuff. Check out these videos here if you want to see movies just as, if not better, than this one. And thanks for watching. Spooky out.